let's dive in here with the idea of average rate of change. You're familiar with the idea of a slope of a line, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And one interpretation that we use for slope is that it gives the rate of change of a function as things progress. And the reason that lines are so nice to work with is that they have a constant rate of change. No matter where on the line you look, the rate at which the function is changing is constant. If we look at an arbitrary curve, it might still be interesting to think about how the curve is changing over some period of time. There are a couple of ways to do that. The easiest one is using a tool called a secant line. So just pick two points on the curve and draw the line through those two points. The average rate of change of the function is the slope of the secant line. If you choose a different two points to study, then the average rate of change between those two points will be different because it will generate a different secant line. So here I chose these two points and got the secant line in yellow. If I choose two points just slightly ahead of those two points, the secant line through those points is very drastically different even though each of those points is not too far away from the one where we started. So the average rate of change depends on which two points you are trying to pass through. For example, let's consider the function f of x is x cubed plus three x squared minus nine x plus five. If I want to find the average rate of change for this function between x equals one and x equals three, I simply evaluate f of one is one plus three minus nine plus five. One plus three is four, four minus nine is negative five and negative five plus five is zero. Then I evaluate f of three, which will be three squared is 27. Three squared is nine. Uh, three times nine is 27, nine times three is also 27. Uh, 27 plus 27 is 54, 54 minus 27 is 27, and 27 plus five is 32. So the average rate of change between x equals one and x equals three is the same thing as finding the slope of the line between the points one zero 
and 332. Taking a problem that we didn't know how to deal with and turning it into one that we've been doing for quite some time at this point. All right. Slope of a line, y2 minus y1, will be 32 minus zero over x2 minus x1, that'll be three minus one. So we're looking at 32 over two, which is 16. The average rate of change in that range is 16. Another relatively simple thing we can talk about with a curve based on this idea of average rate of change is the idea of uh, increasing and decreasing. We say that a function is increasing if its average rate of change is positive between any two points in the interval where we're claiming it's increasing. And we say that the uh, function is decreasing if the average rate of change is negative. key part of this definition is everywhere. A function is increasing on AB if and only if the average rate of change is positive everywhere in AB, and a function is decreasing on AB if and only if the average rate of change is negative everywhere in AB. I apologize, I didn't actually mean to use the abbreviation here, but kind of mathematicians habits never die. The phrase if and only if comes up so often in math that we use IFF as a quick abbreviation so that we don't have to write the whole thing out every time. We could look at this analytically. We could look at the formula given for a function and try to figure out um, where you have positive and negative average rates of change. And for those of you who are moving onward to eventually take calculus, one of the big ideas of calculus is finding ways to do that. For our purposes in this course, we are going to mainly focus on looking at the graph and using the graph to figure out where the function is increasing or decreasing. So let's look at an arbitrary curve that looks something like this. And again, the big key here is that we want to look for ranges where we can say that the function has a positive rate of change or a negative rate of change everywhere in that interval. For example, if I take these two points and try to connect them, we can see that this line has a positive slope. But I would not classify the function as increasing here 
Because if I picked some points a little bit closer together, like say these two points somewhere in the middle where I get a negative slope. So what I'm looking for is a region where we are always positive or where we are always negative. And we do have that. In this particular curve, if I look at this part of the curve, the function is increasing. And if I look at this part of the curve, the function is increasing. Everywhere in that range, the function is heading upward if you read from left to right. In the middle, let's try to actually line that up. In the middle here, we've got a space where the function is decreasing. It's heading downward as you go from left to right. The other possibility is that the function can be constant in some regions. We'll get to that in another example. Before I move on though, I want to focus on these two points where the function changes from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing. These points are called the extrema of the function, where you go from increasing to decreasing is known as a local maximum. And where you go from decreasing to increasing is known as a local minimum. Again, for those of you who are going onward eventually to take a course in calculus, identifying where the local maximum and local minimums are is something that calculus is very well suited for. For our purposes, we are simply going to look at the graph and use the graph to identify where local extrema are occurring. Here I'm on the website Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S dot com. It's supposed to be on screen, it is not. Let's see if I can fix that real quick. There we go. We are on the website called Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S. And Desmos is one, uh, an online graphing tool uh, that I like using just to kind of demonstrate how we can figure things out. So I'm graphing here the function uh, f of x is x cubed plus 2x squared minus 3x minus 1. And we can see, much like the curve that I was describing by hand, we have a function that is increasing for a while until it hits a peak here at negative one point. I'll call that negative 1.9, 5.1. Then it heads downward for a while until it hits a minimum down here, something like 0 0.5, negative 1.9. And then it heads back to being uh, upward once again. So by looking at the graph, by looking at something that's graphed a little bit more nicely than I can graph by hand, we can approximate try to figure out where these extreme points are and use those as a way of approximating where the local maximum and minimum might be. One of the powerful tools of graphing. Up next, we have the idea of algebra of functions. Just like we can perform operations on numbers and on variables and on expressions, we can perform operations on functions. We'll start off with the four arithmetic operations you are accustomed to. If we want to take 
f plus g on x, that's really telling us that we're trying to calculate f of x plus g of x. If we want to subtract functions, f minus g evaluated at x is the way of talking about f of x minus g of x. We can also do f times g, which is f of x times g of x. And we can look at f over g, which is the same thing as f of x over g of x. The obvious question is why? Why do we want to have this more confusing notation, f plus g evaluated at x, instead of simply saying f of x plus g of x? And quite frankly, the answer is that for our purposes this semester, it gains us absolutely nothing. But for those of you who are going to go on and to take further mathematics courses, thinking about functions is going to involve less and less thinking about where the function is being evaluated. So the advantage that this notation will have in the long run is that it will allow us to abstract away and stop worrying about actually trying to evaluate a function. Because once you get into calculus and the mathematics beyond that, actually evaluating the function is very rarely the useful thing to do. In this course, the goal is simply to have some convenient notation and get you accustomed to the notation so that when it comes up again in future classes, it's not that crazy. We can use this notation to simply perform an evaluation. So for example, if I have the function f of x is x over x plus one, and I have the function g of x is two x times the square root of x then I can evaluate f plus g evaluated at nine by simply evaluating f of nine plus g of nine. f of nine is nine over nine plus one. g of nine is two times nine times the square root of nine. 9 over 9 plus 1 is 9 over 10. Uh, square root of 9 is 3. 2 times 9 is 18. So this is 18 times 3, which is 54. And we have a couple of options of what to do from here. I'm going to give the answer only a mathematician can love, which is to rewrite 54 as 540 over 10. So we get the final result of 549 over 10. You can also use this notation as a way of defining a new function. So let's keep these same two functions here f of x is x plus one, g of x is two x square root of x. Only this time, instead of simply trying to evaluate, let's write an expression for g over f evaluated at x. Well, by definition, g over f evaluated at x is g of x over f of x. 
And g of x is 2x square root of x. f of x is x over x plus 1. If I simply multiply top and bottom of the big fraction by x plus 1, then I'll be able to cancel out that denominator. Right. Um, a little bit of a mess here. I think the best way to write this would be 2 times x times x plus 1 times the square root of x all over x. Again, x divided by x plus 1 times x plus 1 will cancel each other out. And then I notice further that there's an x in the numerator and an x in the denominator that cancel each other out. And I end up with 2 times x plus 1 times the square root of x. Although I do have to be careful on a couple of points. I multiplied top and bottom of the fraction by x plus 1. I can only do that if x plus 1 is not 0, which means that x is not negative 1. And then in the next step, I canceled out a factor of x. And I cannot do that if x is equal to 0. So g over f evaluated at x is 2 times x plus 1 times the square root of x. As long as x is not 0 or negative 1. g over f evaluated at 0 and evaluated at negative 1 are undefined. And that is one thing that you do have to be careful about when you are dealing with uh, combining functions like this. The resulting function is going to have its own domain and range. And what those will be is not always obvious by the final result. In the case of f plus g, in the case of f minus g, and in the case of f times g, these all follow the rule that the domain is all values where both f and g are defined. In the more precise mathematical notation, this is the set intersection of the domain of f and the domain of g. The quotient as you probably will not be surprised. F over G evaluated at X has one more restriction. F and G are defined and G of X is not zero. So when you divide two functions, you have to further look for the case of g of x not zero. Taking these ideas back to the functions we started with, I can look at, in this case we have g over f, so we're looking for places where g is undefined, we're looking for places where f is undefined, and we're looking for places where f is not zero. So we already figured out just by playing around what the domain and range of G over F evaluated at X would be. But now I'm going to look for
the analytic way of doing the same thing, right? So F, the thing that's in the denominator of this fraction, we know that that's undefined when the denominator X plus one is equal to zero, which means that X is equal to negative one. We also know that this is equal to zero when x over x plus one equals zero, multiplying both sides of the equation by x plus one simply gives me that x is equal to zero. So x equals zero is also a problem. And then I didn't mention it when we went through the first time, but we also have issues with g of x, two x square root of x. Of course, square root is only defined for positive and zero, it's not defined for negative values of x. So that's one other thing that we have to worry about. G of x is undefined when the square root of x, I'm sorry, not square root, the stuff inside is less than zero, the stuff underneath the square root. Right. I didn't make specific mention of that when we went through algebraically to find the um, expression for the function because there was still a square root of x in the expression and you still have the implicit domain of this is only defined for places where you can evaluate the function. Up next, let's take a look at function composition. Composition is a new operation that you're not familiar with because you can't perform composition on numbers or on expressions. Composition is denoted using a circle operator. So if we want F composed with G, we write it looking like this. It kind of looks like the letter O. It's slightly smaller than the letter O, right? This is not just the word fog. This is F composed with G. And we evaluate F composed with G at X by taking the function F and evaluating it at the point g of x. Algebraically, this is an idea that you have worked with before, but without using function notation, you can't really talk about how to perform this idea. So if we take a look at a couple of functions, let's say that f of x is x, over x plus one and g of x is three x plus five. Well then f composed with g evaluated at say three is f evaluated at g of three. Plugging in three for G, this is F of three times three plus five. Three times three is nine, nine plus five is 14. So this problem is really telling us to evaluate F of 14. Of course, we know that F is X over X plus one. So F of 14 is 14 over 14 plus one which is 14 over 15. Compare that if we swap these things around. Consider instead G composed with F evaluated at three. Well, the definition of composition says that we are looking at G evaluated at 
f of three. And of course we can evaluate f of three. That's three over three plus one. And three over three plus one is three fourths. So this problem is really asking us to evaluate g at three fourths. Right? g is three x plus five. So this is three times three fourths plus five. An answer only a mathematician can love. Let's rewrite five as 20 over four. So nine fourths plus 20 fourths is 29 over four. And of course, just like we did with the other operations, when we are looking at function composition, it can be interesting to try to find a general expression for f composed with g evaluated at x. And once again, this is an idea that you have seen previously. Substituting an expression in for a variable, now we have a name and a way of describing that operation. So f composed with g is f evaluated at g of x. And of course, g of x is 3x plus 5. So we want to evaluate f of 3x plus 5. Right? Take my function f of x, replace x with 3x plus 5, and we have 3x plus 5. I shouldn't write that over here. I should finish that over here. We have 3x plus 5 over 3x plus 5 plus 1 which is 3x plus 5 over 3x plus 6. And again, we should be able to perform this uh, composition in either order. So if I wanted g composed with f evaluated at x instead, this would be g of f of x, or g of x over x plus 1, and g is 3 times x plus 5, replace x with x over x plus 1. We have 3 times x over x plus 1 plus 5. Right. Rewrite 5 as 5x plus 5 over x plus 1. and we get eight x plus five over x plus one, a drastically different function than we had with f composed with g. So function composition allows us to play around with functions in a couple of different ways. Um, honestly, this direction is very rarely useful. It's a good idea to drill uh, evaluating composition, either evaluating a composition at a point or using composition to find an expression. But the place where we really care about function composition is actually in decomposition.
our goal is for some function like h of x equals the square root of 3x minus 9 to find functions f of x and g of x so that h of x is f composed with g evaluated at x. This is very much more of an art than a science, but thinking about functions this way lets us break down complicated functions into individual pieces and work with those pieces on their own. In this particular case, we have a kind of obvious square root, right? We're taking a square root and then we're doing stuff with the square root. So it jumps out in my mind right away. If we set f of x equal to that square root and then set g of x equal to the stuff underneath the square root, then f composed with g, I should write that as I said it, f composed with g evaluated at x or f of g of x is f of 3x minus 9 or the square root of 3x minus 9. So again, more of an art than a science. But when I see that square root, I immediately grab it and say, think about this thing as a square root and stuff under the square root. This is two functions composed together. We can do the same thing pretty easily with fractions. If I have h of x is one over x squared plus five x minus nine, And we want to find f and g. So h is f composed with g. I notice right away that I have a fraction and I have a mess in the denominator of the fraction. So my thought right away is if I set f as one over x, talking faster than I'm writing. F of X is one over X and G of X is the stuff in that denominator. Then F of G of X would be F evaluated at X squared plus five X minus nine, which is exactly one over X squared plus five X minus nine, where we started. With that, I'm going to wrap up and I'll see you in the next video.